Hi, my name is Kevin Fortune. I'm a makeup artist and hairstylist, and I've been working in the industry for over 25 years. I love what I do, and I do what I love. I've always loved hair. I've always loved makeup. I didn't know how to get into it. I didn't know um, how you could even train to be a makeup artist or hairstylist. So my dad told me to get a really good job. So I got a good job working for Customs and Excise at Heathrow Airport and arrested people for drug smuggling. <laughs> okay. And then eventually left that when I realized, actually, that's not what I want to do. I want to be create creative. I want to create some form of art. Um, I want to work with people. I like working with new people I've never met. Um, I really like finding myself in situations where I don't know anyone. I feel comfortable when I don't know the people because then I can create myself as whoever I want to in that moment. I wanted to travel. I wanted to travel. I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to see different places. I wanted to meet and work with lots of different people. And I think with my career, that's what I get the opportunity to do. All those things. It encompasses everything. Working with celebrities, working behind the camera, working in front of the camera. Creating amazing... I'd like to say works of art because we, we me and my partner we, uh, Martin we also run a, an academy and it's called the art of hairstyling so we like to consider what we do as artistic and it has an artistic value you know when you ask me where my creativity comes from I have to really 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 think hard about it because my dad wasn't particularly creative my mum wasn't creative um, my dad played the piano so he said um, and actually we, he bought an organ so we all practiced from an early age how to play the organ so musically my dad loved music um, and loved buying albums and was a DJ so he would spend a lot of time buying music uh, and that's as, as, uh, that's as, that is as artistic I think as we get as the family get um, I don't know where it comes from. I know that when I was very young and I spent a lot of time with my nan because I just love spending time with her and she used to put rollers in her hair and she's from South America so people from South America tend to have quite straight hair, afro texture but straight hair and I was about six and I put a set of rollers in her hair and she kept on saying I put them in upside down and I couldn't understand what she meant by upside down, you know what's upside down mean to a six-year-old but she said the curls going the wrong way and I couldn't work out what she meant by the curls going the wrong way so I guess around then um, I started to get interested in it because I couldn't work out why things were going wrong or why she not that she was upset but why it didn't go as well as I thought it would and then also she used to have one lipstick no sorry she had two lipsticks and um one was red and one was redder. And she, sometimes she'd put one on and she'd say, which colour? And I'd go, no, the other one. And she'd put the other one on and they'd literally just wipe it off and then powder it. And that was it. That was her lipstick. But we spent ages sitting over her little table choosing which lipstick she would wear and um, how to put her rollers in. So I guess from a very early age, that's where my interest in makeup and hair started. Since I was 10 or 11, I was cutting hair or styling hair or bleaching hair or colouring hair. And, you know, I'm no spring chicken, so you can tell by my beard, I'm, I'm 50 now. So when I was 16, this was like the late, late 70s, no, no, the mid, early 80s, 1982, something like that. So... What was happening around then, actually before that, so let's say when I was um, 14, 13 or 14, it was around 1979. 
And so you had Spandau Ballet and New Romantics and um, uh, Thompson Twins and all these groups that were coming out with the craziest hairstyles, different colours, different shapes. You had um, Toya. Um, and I was just so excited about all the different things that people could do to their hair. And also, it was a time when lots of girls were cutting their hair quite short, so you had a big flick, short sides, or girls are having their hair permed, and then blow drying the top straight back, and the back was curly, and they were having their hair bleached or highlighted, so suddenly everyone was having their hair streaked at the time. And we couldn't afford to buy the cap that you'd have the streaks done, so I would pierce holes in a plastic bag and just pull my friend's hair through and then bleach it. I had no idea what I was doing, but I didn't care. I just thought, let's just see what happens. And then also it was a time when mousse was first introduced to the, the general public. So it was the first time girls could blow dry their hair with a product in that held their hair in place. And so I, was, I remember blow drying girls' hair and their hair just staying in place, even though their hair was only short. It would just stay stuck up in the air. So those, are, I feel like that was my training. It was a good time to kind of like try lots of different colours, lots of different techniques. As I said, had no idea what I was doing, but willing to try everything. And then I was going to go and work in a hairdresser's and a salon when I was 16. And um, I was really excited to go and work in Debenhams, in the Arndale Centre in Luton. And my friend Samantha, she had a job. I remember walking past her and she was sweeping up the floor, just sweeping hair up. And I was so excited at the fact, sorry, just about this. I was so excited at the fact that she was um, sweeping hair up and I was going to get to sweep hair up that um, I just used to walk past the, the salon and just stare in it and just watch her sweeping hair. But then my friends, all my friends put it me, I had a lot of very straight heterosexual mates and they went, what do you want to work in a hairdresser for you, puff? So I decided I'd go and work for customers exercise. So I kind of decided that to go a completely different direction and um, become an officer. I had to work really hard in an office in London, which I had no idea had any connection to the Heathrow Airport. And I got promoted, and I got promoted, and then someone said to me, oh, you can go and work at Heathrow Airport. So I kind of got a job having no idea where it was going to lead me, and it just so happened I kind of fell in love at Heathrow Airport. So I was kind of chasing a dream of falling in love with someone. And when it didn't happen, uh, I thought, okay, well, I'm here now, so I'll just carry on doing this job. It was fine. It was paying really, really, really well for a 19, 20 year old. And my dad, it made him happy because he said, well, you've got a job, you've got a great pension. And you know, what 20 year old is thinking about their pension. So I remember walking into the office one morning and I was stamping back forms on this particular day. Uh, it was six o'clock in the morning and I literally fell asleep while stamp, stamping some woman's back form in front of her, in front of the queue, just like... <clears throat> and I, so I got up quickly, went round the back, slapped myself around the face a couple of times, and then walked into my exec's office and, office, and I just said, I'm leaving. And they were like, what do you mean you're leaving? I, said, I can't do this job anymore. I cannot do this anymore. I hate coming here. And I think it was then when I realised I've got to chase some k kind of dream in which... I would wake up every single day and be so excited to go to work that it didn't feel like work. It just felt like, oh my God, I get to do something that's really exciting. So that's the time when I realised there's no way I can do something that's got this monotonous, day by day, boring, same old, same old kind of thing, just chasing money, because it wasn't about the money, because I had money and I had a sports car be it a Vauxhall Nova at the time, which was sporty at the time, <clears throat> alloy wheels and a guard at the back. And that wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for me. I had to do something that was exciting. Yeah. 
Um, the support I got from my family was, mm, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do this? I mean, the pension's good. You've been there six years now. Come on, you know, you've, you've only got another 40 years before you retire. I'm just, and I was, that just sealed it for me. I remember my dad's sister saying, are you crazy? You know, it's a really good job. It's, a, it's amazing that I was very fortunate that I had a very um, strong network of family around me, and, you know, and they were always been there. And my dad was an amazing human being that always encouraged us to follow our dreams. And if you're not careful, I think you can end up doing what your parents want you to do. And not really striving for something that really excites you, well, really excited me. So I, it was a huge step to kind of go against what my parents wanted for me and just drive myself forward and do something completely different. So yes, for my mum, she was like, well, do it, just do it. If you're not happy, just leave. And for my dad, he was like, well, are you sure? There's the pension. So it had the flip side of the coins, but I just took the risk and just left. I'd have to go back and explain something. When I was growing up in Luton, on a council estate, and it was really nice, don't get me wrong, it was a really nice estate on the end, the edge of Luton and Dunstall. And we'd watch TV and you'd see programmes, I can't remember the names of the programmes, there was a programme about Las Vegas, it was a detective guy who was a detective in Las Vegas. And I remember closing my eyes and going really close to the screen and pretending that I was in Las Vegas, just walking down the streets as the credits went around. And so I'd do the same thing if I saw anything to do with New York and I would dream about going to New York, Las Vegas, the Grand Canyon, um, Australia. If I saw anything that had to do with any other country, it was, it was like, it's like something took me over, took over my, my soul and it's just like, you've got to go and do that. You've got to go and do that. You've got to go and visit there. But I had no idea how I was ever going to get there. So when I took the job working for Customs and Excise, I felt that at any moment I could stow away in an airplane and find myself in another country. It was a dream and it kept me going for a time at the airport, but the next thing was to get out and really not necessarily find something that would get me to Las Vegas or one of those places, but I just, there was still that burning desire to travel. So when I uh, left customs, what I did is I wrote down a list of all the things that would really excite me. And I just kept on writing lists and lists and lists of things that I would do for free. So when I eventually um, by a fluke of nature, because I was around a friend's house who was looking through, and he was thinking of going to um, college and there was a course, a makeup and hair course. And I didn't even know that there was even a makeup and hair course that you could do. Um, it was just like a punch in the face or in the chest that said, there's your opportunity to go and do all the things that you want to do. And in a, in a, I think in a moment's flash, I was able to see nearly like a life of things that would be really exciting with all the travel and everything I want to do.